Good evening. How's everybody doing? Every, for a Tuesday night, it's okay, right? Beautiful weather. It's not summer. It's not winter. It's fall in Pennsylvania. It's one of the better times to be in Pennsylvania, right? All right. And we're, you know, I'm just, I'm just fine with this back and forth stuff. So um, it's a delight to be back here and uh, working with uh, Andrew and all the folks here at Man Lake. And by the way, the people in the back of the room, when I was started a year at Man Lake. Frank was the manager. I think he now reports to Andrew. Uh, and Andrew was the flunky. <laughs> he helped me unload everything, load up the car, you know. So see, there's, there's, there's hope yet. So tonight we got a lot to do. I want to talk about Queens and I want to talk about Queen Ring and it's going to be hard to get it all in. So I want to know, first of all, a little bit about you folks and where you are. How many are brand new beekeepers? All right, so about 10, 15% of you. How many of you have had bees more than five years? Okay, that tells me a lot. How many of you have more than 100 colonies? Wow, okay, how many have over uh, 10 colonies? Okay, well, we got some serious work to do then, folks. <laughs> So when we talk about queens and how to live with them, we're going to review queen biology. We're going to talk about how to produce queens, how bees produce queens. That's my emphasis tonight. But we're going to get into queen rearing. We're going to talk about mating behavior. We're going to talk about, a little bit about drone congregation areas and how uh, queen bees recognize each other, or, or worker bees recognize queen bees, and all the things that are involved with that. Now the first thing you need to do if you're going to be a, it, working with queen honeybees is to forget all that stuff that goes on in England about royalty, the queen, the king, and all of that. You know, perhaps the best, um, I'm sorry if this is making, is that too breathy? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the best analogy I can make for beekeepers is the madness of uh, King George which, you know, the, the, the king that went crazy. So th that reminds you of, the, of where we are in beekeeping, that quite often we start to go mad when we start trying to deal with honeybee queens and all the things that are going on. Also get the, the idea that the queen's in charge of the hive out of, your, out of your brain. It does not happen. The queen bee has no say whatsoever it what goes on inside that hive. It's up to the workers. It's a communist society, if you believe in things like that. Where, well, it's, you know, an Amazonian society, if you will, because the women are in charge. The drones are there for the convenience of the queen. And that's it. So the worker bees, they're all female. They are in charge of deciding collectively, and if you want to know how that works, read some of Tom Seeley's work. Uh, Honeybee Democracy and other books that he's done. You want to understand how they, they kind of work this out. And they want, to, the bees are going to work for the betterment of that colony, trying to come up with a consensus that work, works well for finding a new hive, finding food together, and when and how to, not necessarily how, but certainly when to replace a queen. What are the measurements that they're looking at? So we're going to touch on that. We're not going to go uh, in real depth, because that's a lecture in its own right. Now, here's a queen bee with a nice red dot on her. You can see she's surrounded by a retinue of worker bees. The queen is working at the mercy of the worker bees, and her two main functions are what? Laying eggs and making chemicals that, keep the, that provide the cohesion for that colony. So you've got a an insect that's producing a complex group of chemicals called pheromones. A pheromone is a chemical that influences uh, an individual of the same species. So by comparison, when varroa mites go after drone brood, they're attracted much the same way with chemicals, but that's not a pheromone, that's a caramone with a K just for your little bit of trivia. So we've got these two major functions. If anything happens to a queen during her life, 
that she has a reduction in her two functions, in her ability to lay eggs and her ability to produce pheromone. And that happens with age. She slows down. She's not able to produce as many eggs per day. How many eggs does the queen produce a day? 1,500? I've had them produce 1,800, and I marked a queen once that was a, a marvelous Vivic high, uh, Minnesota hygienic that was producing 2,200 eggs a day. So here's, here's a queen that's laying, and when she lays eggs, what does she do? She inspects with her head. She apparently is measuring the size of the cell with her antennae. She backs up and she puts her abdomen into that cell. If her measurements of the cell indicate that it's a small cell, like a worker brood cell, she's going to lay an egg that's fertilized. If it's a larger cell, it isn't a matter of pressure, it's a matter of interpreting the signal from that measurement. Then she'll lay an egg that's unfertilized, which becomes a, a drone. So these are some of the things you have to keep in mind because while I doubt whether the queen consciously knows what she's doing, she's responding to a very complex group of, of uh, stimuli and what's going on there. Now, old queens are generally repro reproduced, excuse me, are, are replaced through a process we call supersedure. And uh, that is, again, an elaborate mechanism where the worker bees are measuring the performance of the queen and are coming up with the conclusion that she's got to go. And this could be a gradual thing. It could be rather abrupt, that she is going to be put out to pasture. And sometimes supersedure will exist over a period of time. Now, here in the Northeast, and in Michigan, where I live now, I expect to see queens, uh, colonies to have two queens for about a month and a half to two months every spring. That's mother and daughter. Not every colony, but some colonies will have two queens, mother and daughter. Prior to varroa mites, there was an English strain where beekeepers were collecting queens that kept their daughters, or, or the, the bees kept the mother and the daughter in the hive for up to a year. So you have the combined egg laying, the failing egg laying of one queen, and the, the booming egg laying of a second queen to build up the colony. Is this the right way to approach it? I don't know, but that's something people were looking for. You know, when people, when humans get involved with these, things happen, sometimes for better or for worse. All right, so, with supersedure, we tend to find the cells on the face of the comb, right? Uh, no, no guarantees. It could be at the bottom if that's where the, the brood nest is. And the bees are picking larvae that are of a particular, uh, are, are attracted to them in terms of having the right components. So they're, they're, basically it's age. They want a young larvae, but they, I'll, I'll, as I explain later, they may actually take uh, an older larvae from time to time and use them. So if you have a colony that's failing, the queen is failing, not the colony is failing, but because the, colony, the queen is failing, the colony doesn't look so hot. So you see a frame like this. There are multiple problems here, right? I think, I'm looking at this slide this, this afternoon, and I think, I think this may be a light case of European fall brood. But that's not, our, that's not my point. We have a reduction in the egg laying rate. It's very spotty. I don't think this is a function of varroa mites. I think this is a failing queen. She's running out of sperm. The bees are starting the process of producing a daughter queen. So how many cells do we see? Two? One up here and one over here, right? Oh, and uh, okay, yeah, one over there. So there's three and maybe a fourth one there. And are they following the book? Here at the bottom, are they swarm cells or are they just cups? So we don't know in the, until we look. Uh, there's no guarantee in how all this is going to work together. So 
with a viable queen, a healthy queen, if you will, the other extreme. She lays up that colony and she's got brood in every corner. We've got young bees emerging in large numbers. The opposite extreme happens. The colony says, we need to swarm. We're going to produce daughter queens. We're going to produce a number of daughter queens. So the old queen can leave with the primary swarm and leave an array of ages of daughter queens so that some will emerge to go with a second swarm it's, and a third swarm. And those secondary and tertiary and sometimes quaternary and whatever, there may be multiple queens. My record is eight queens in a swarm. How many have you seen? Two? All right. Well, we have an auction here. Three? Okay. So, you see the point is, those bees are taking young, unmated queens with a swarm, and at that point, those young queens are producing some of that pheromone. Not as much as a laying queen does. They're taking some of that pheromone and they're going to go out and find a new home using all those processes that uh, Tom Seeley has described in Honeybee Democracy, and they vote on locations. And if somebody says, I want to go here, and the rest of the bees say no, they, they kind of hold those bees back. They do a full body block. It says, so they vote for the ones that are the most bees are dancing for. Now, as we do this, the, the parent colony is draining off a large number of the worker bees, right? And so you've got the last of those queens will probably become the new mother of that colony. So here it is, May or June, colonies swarming. They've issued three or four swarms. The last queen that's produced by the bees is going to go out and mate, and maybe she'll make it back. Uh, statistically, about 75% of the time she does, 25% of the time she's eaten by a dragonfly caught by a thunderstorm, or she goes to the wrong hive and is killed by her neighbor hives, bees. So 25% loss, wait a minute. Have you factored that into your, I'm gonna let the bees swarm? that you're gonna have that kind of a loss, what's gonna to happen to that colony if they lose their queen? You're gonna go back into that colony in July or August and there are gonna be a, a bunch of eggs, multiple eggs in the bottom of the cells, and they're all gonna develop into drone brood, worker-sized drone brood. And those are laying workers. And that's a reflection of this whole system going belly up, that you've got a a uh, complete reversal of what the bees wanted, biologically wanted, and what you want as a beekeeper. So this is why I promote the idea of you making up the increased colonies rather than letting the bees make the decisions. On the other hand, if you have a colony that's got laying workers, there are ways that you can manage them uh, if you're willing to work at it. So that primary swarm that you're, you're catching, three, four, five pounds of bees, it's a great prize. How many of you catch swarms? Yeah, most of us do. If we're physically able and it, it's fun. I rely on swarms. I've, jet, I've let my bees produce swarms. And I now rely on swarms to come into my empty equipment every year and repopulate the hives. I'm serious. If you have empty equipment and you monitor, you monitor what's going on, that once you have a, a stable bee environment in your community, and I'm in the city of Kalamazoo, I know it's not a big city, but the bees are coming in every year. And my son says, oh, the scout bees are checking out, you know, he'll tell me which hive. And a couple of days later, we've got a swarm in there. So it is something you can look forward, forward to if you're patient and you're willing to put up with a little of Mother Nature's vagaries. Here you can see a swarm in the air. You've all seen it, right? 
It's a fun, happy thing. It brings me joy. It also brings me joy when they come back or you put them into a new hive. I love watching bees crawl back into a box or a new box. I just think it's the coolest thing. I know I have some strange behaviors. All right. I'm not happy with this microphone. Just going on record. A sudden death of a queen. You're out working your beehive, and you accidentally shake a frame a little too hard, or the queen does a swan dive off of the frame onto the ground, and you go crunch. <laughs> or I have had this happen. You feel a bee crawling up your leg, and you reach down and you pinch her, and you realize that was too big to be a worker bee. <laughs> and you shake the dead queen out of your pant legs. Done that too. All right. Emergencies happen all the time in the bee world. It's not just at the hands of beekeepers. You've got two options basically that are at work here. The bees are going to produce queens with queen cups or they're going to modify queen uh, worker cells to become emergency cells. And usually it's the cells that they're going to work on. So they're going to rebuild those worker cells. Um, so queen cups are often used are used for swarm cell production, for swarming, which we just talked about, and they're used in supersedure. So here are some cells at the bottom. This is a fairly new hive, new equipment. And you see a cup over here on the third frame and a, a cell here on the uh, two over. You see some drone brood. What else do you see? OK, maybe queens over here on the second one. And this is going to tell you what to look at. You take the frame out. And you see one, two, three cells, maybe a cup uh, here, here, and here. And f there's four of them, I see one, two, three, four. And now you can turn the frame over and see what's on the other side, right? I always forget to do that. I get so excited. Time out. You see this. Is this swarming? Is this supersedure? Is this emergency? What do you think? You said it, you, you call it a swarm cell. Yeah. Why? Because it's on, uh, at the bottom of the frame. You're, get, you're absolutely sure of that. Yeah. You're sure it's not that's where the end of the brood nest is yeah. and it's a supersedure cell. Uh, or, or really, which is day, day nine, that probably mother bee has already left with the swarm. Uh, he's saying the mother queen has probably left with the swarm. That's in, in, in entirely possible, yes. But what I'm, uh, all I'm trying to say is that these systems are very fluid. And sometimes you have colonies that look like they're going to be producing swarms and they're used for supersedure. Sometimes you have supersedure cells and the colonies swarm. And on a very rare case, they, they produce queen cells and nothing happens. That's pretty rare. But don't just assume. But I look at this and I say, Larry, is it time to make an increased colony? Can I make a split? Can I take two or three frames of bees out of this colony, or maybe a frame out of this colony with the queen cells, two frames out of another colony, set those three frames on top of a third hive that's got lots of bees, and let the nurse and take all the bees off, either shake or brush them off, and let them go back, and then let the nurse bees in that third colony crawl up in what I call a do little increase, because that's you know, Gilbert Dillard was the first person I read that did this. And let the bees crawl up and cover those bees. You give them a queen cell, come back the next day, move that over. You can set it right beside the hive it came from because none of those bees have foraged. They haven't flown. So now you've got a new colony. So instead of those bees ending up in the trees, assuming it's a swarm cell, I'm agreeing with you there, then, then you can use this. And do you cut some of those cells out or do you leave them in there? The biggest problem I have is those queen cells, if I put them into the wrong box, they're going to get smashed because they're, they're sticking down below. They're in the space of the, the frames below 
so that they don't get hurt. And sometimes they'll be attached to those frames below. When you pull them out, you've got some ruptured cells. So you have to decide, am I going to put that? That looks like a, a medium depth frame, doesn't it? So I'm going to put it in a, a deep hive and not damage the cell. So that's the kind of decision making you're constantly having to do when you're working with your colonies. I want to spend a few minutes talking about, I'm going to sit down for this. I have to concentrate. A, a project that happened 40 years ago. Rick Fell has been a professor in Virginia and has retired. Roger Morris is the man I bought Wickwas Press from, and uh, I believe his wife, Mary Lou, is in her 90s, late 90s. She's living in Thailand, of all places. But Rick Fell and Roger Morris, 1984, they did a study on emergency cell production. And I'm talking about all this because I want you to keep this in mind when, you, when we start changing gears and we're talking about queen rearing. Queen loss was detected by the bees within 6 to 12 hours. You know that, right? You can, you can hear the difference. You take a, a queen out, you can kind of hear that ventilation, that fanning. Some people call it the queenless roar. So it's fairly, fairly immediate. And you see a, a larger number of bees that are scenting. That's so their abdomen's up in the air and they're fanning their wings and they're producing a pheromone. And then they start raising queen cups. The number of scenting bees reaches a peak about 12 to 24 hours. So if you go in and de de queen a colony, they're probably reaching a peak during the evening of that day and then the next morning. And this is going to decline, but then the number of queen cells they're producing is going to increase. The, uh, most of the queen cells are going to be produced between 12 and 48 hours. So half a day to two days they're going to start that queen cell production. And as you see, or you don't see, uh, it's going to be an approximate thing because some of those emergency cells are going to be based on larvae that are less than two days of age. So when we graft, or if we select colonies for queen rearing, we tend to go for the youngest possible larvae to start a queen. You all knew that, right? I'm sorry if I turned my back on you folks. It's not on purpose. And then, but 25% are three-day-old larvae. So you can produce queens from those bigger larvae if you're producing queens. And even 10% are four days. That's a big larvae. Now, is this desperation by the bees that, they, that they, they're going to use larvae that old? But this, you know, I'm not arguing with this work. I'm just saying there's a lot of variability, a lot of flexibility in this system in nature. The key here is that they're selecting larvae and not eggs. Of 268 cells, only two were eggs. Uh, one survived and one developed into a drone. Okay, that's interesting. I have no explanation for that. Because the next line, it says that the overall rate for queen cell construction over drone larvae was 9.3%. 10% of the queen cells will never produce a queen. No matter what magic you've got in your toolbox, those drones will never lay eggs. Is this an aberration of the study? I don't know. It needs to be repeated. To be. So if you put in a frame of eggs and larvae, and, and in this case it was all, uh, these were all newly emerged eggs, hatched eggs, you put them into a queenless colony, you come back in 24 hours, you expect to see a lot of queen cells. 
But as time goes on, if you check every day very quickly, the number of those cells will be reduced. And the bees are selecting. You know, I say, well, we don't think this one's going to be a good queen. Whatever they're thinking. Well, I don't think they're thinking. They're responding to the stimuli of the hive. And so they're going to end up with a fewer number of these cells. So the rate of GNU cell production after queen loss was high for two or two, four days and then declined, which is kind of what that one frame showed. The number of cells produced peaked on the third or fourth day. So you've got this increase in the number of cells and then a reduction. Questions on what I've said so far? Well, how does it happen that the old queen, the mother's queen, or mother queen doesn't leave the hive for whatever reason, maybe she cannot fly, or and that uh, her daughter doesn't kill her when she, when she has it. Okay, you're asking why the daughter doesn't quill an, kill an old queen if the old queen can't leave. Mm -hmm. Well, who kills who? Does the daughter kill her or do the worker bees kill her? The newborn queen will kill her sister, right? Uh, They'll kill her sisters, but not their mother. Not Generally, the, worker, the, worker, the new queens will will not kill their mother. It's the worker bees that kind of force her out the door. All right, the number of cells produced by a colony usually peaks the third or fourth day. Did it work? Yes. The number of queen cells started by a colony varied from 11 to 49. The mean was four to 20. Of the cells that are produced, 40% of them were destroyed. 40%. Now this tells you that when you're raising queens as a beekeeper, you should expect to see a loss in your queen cells, unless you are just doing a super, super job of raising queens. That there is a natural selection by the bees to eliminate some of them. And uh, here's the other thing that just scares the hell out of me. New queen cells were started as later as eight or nine days after dequeening. Wait a minute. Aren't they pretty much pupae at that point? So, yeah, that's kind of scary. All right. So here are some queen cells in development. I see three. Do you see more than three? One over here, two over here. And what I look for on queen cell production is white wax. Do you see the white wax on the two on the right? There's not so much on the one on, on the left. So if I were to go into a colony and say, I'm going to select two cells, I'd take the ones on the right, cut out the one on the left. Why? Because there's not white wax. But, but what about the white wax? The white wax then indicates that the bees are paying more attention to her. They're doing the following things. They're feeding that larvae. They're maintaining the temperature so that they need a higher temperature to put wax down around a queen cell. need a hotter temperature around them. So three or four worker bees are going to be on that cell, on those two cells, generating heat, the thermal bees, the hot bees. I'm not talking about uh, jalapeno pepper hot. I'm talking about temperature hot. And so they're generating heat. And now the worker bees are going to add wax to that. So while we're on <clears throat> while we're on this topic with the cells if we were grafting in jzbz cell cups and we came back and there was that white wax around the tip of those cell cups would yeah. you be able to assume that those cells would more than likely be the ones that they're going to decide to draw yeah i would use the white wax as an indicator that they they're on, going to be accepted actual cell cups as yes well. on the cups and you know because they're going to build a little volcano of wax yeah. And you're going to have white wax on the plastic and on the on the wax. Got it. So that you can use that in other. Yeah, you can use that as a good indicator. Okay, okay. My, mating behavior. I brought a book. I want you to consider. It's mating biology of the honeybees, Apis mellifera, by Gundren and Nicholas Kerniger, who are German scientists and good friends. Jamie Ellis in Florida, Lawrence Connor, whoever that is. Um, the Kernigers wanted help because they, while their English is proficient, 
It's German English. You know what I'm talking about? So we help translate it. You know, I, I, I joke, I say, well, I had to take the Georgia accent out of this book because Jamie worked on it, and then I had to go through. But it, it was a collaborative effort. You need to understand how bees mate. I have a book on bee sex essentials. I'm not putting it up because I've only got one left today. I'll send it to you if you, if you really want it. But mating behavior, and it is fascinating to me that we know so much more about sex and worker bees, and queen bees, than we ever have. And we now know that those queens, when I was in graduate student, uh, graduate school, back in the old days, we were told that every queen mated with one drone. This is the 1960s. And then in the 70s, you know, the, oh, they're a little more yeah. promiscuous. promiscuous. <laughs> Curiously promiscuous, the phrase that we use. And so now we've got genetic evidence that you can find different genetic patterns up to 61 drones in one spermatheca. That's one busy female. Now, is she able to do that all in one trip? I don't know. She's not telling. But we know from the study that Kernigers and others have done, the actual mating process is very fast, a matter of seconds. And so one drone mounts the queen, ejaculates, falls back, falls off. The next drone mounts the queen. He's got a device on his legs that pulls out the junk from the first drone. He mounts the queen, falls back, ejaculates. It just goes on and on and on. So in a 30-second period, that queen could mate with a number of drones. How many? Well, it's kind of hard to stay, be up there with the stopwatch. Now, at the meeting Saturday or Sunday, Mark Gindrich, the president of the uh, Pennsylvania Beekeepers, gave a talk about his work with mechanical drones and suspended queens to look at mating in drone in DCAs. So we're going to get close-up photos real fast on all this. All right. So we may blow our socks off. So keep in mind that queens only mate outside the hive. If they're mating with 14 to 16 drones and the mating is going to happen while between she's one and two weeks old. She can mate later, but she's probably not going to. At that point, her pheromone production is going to have her settle into egg laying even if she's not fertilized. So you can get a queen, an older queen that's in a hive that's laying eggs, and that colony is going to go droning on you. have a, a virgin queen and she leaves, let's say like two or three days, you know, around that day seven or yeah, day after eight or seven. nine. And yeah. What would happen that would keep her from going out for nearly 20 days? Like, would it be heavy rain? What well, any, any weather summer? event, any weather event. And we all, we've all seen weather reports from Georgia where we, a lot of us get our queens and packages and they say oh the season's delayed because it's rained for two weeks in georgia that means you've lost the whole cycle of queens that'll never mate the, the producer should go in and destroy those queens and put new cells in or new new queens in and the drones that were going to be mating they're, they've died of old age without a smile on their face i i i, I Shouldn't say that. I yell at my son when he makes comments like that. All right. All right. Uh, we've kind of talked about that. So the only other time a queen is likely to fly after she's finished this mating flight is if she goes out on a swarm. Now, there could be an absconding swarm, which I'm going to just say is a, a subtype of swarming, so I covered it. All right, virgin queens. 
We, we love these ladies. I, I have worked with Virgin Queens for an intense period of about five years where we were emerging them, marking them, putting them into colonies, letting them mate, letting them come back, and we knew that we had that queen because she was marked. A couple of sidebars here. When you're handling virgins, you're getting her pheromone on your fingers. I wasn't wearing gloves. And then the next virgin queen you handle smells the first virgin's pheromones and she stings your fingertips. I'm serious. So you get a lot of stings. I don't get that from mated queens. Do you? Handling queens, marking them. So they are feisty little rascals. The other thing that happens with virgin queens is that if you don't have complete mastery of her position in space and time, she will fly away. And almost predictably, she will come back. And then, you know, five, ten minutes later, she's, she's crawling around on your work table. And you say, what have you been doing? Have you just gone out exploring or have you mated? She's too young to mate, according to the books. So we'll put her back in the cage and say, okay, she's still a virgin. And if she made it naturally, you know, she just got a head start. I don't think she's mated. We haven't found any that with mating signs. The third ramification, and this is what's important if you're raising queens, is if you are handling a lot of queens, and if you have virgin queens in a queen rearing operation, they're going to fly out and they won't come back because they're going into a queenless colony that you're trying to do something with in queen rearing and they're going to occupy that colony and mess up your draft. You don't want a virgin queen in a cell builder or cell finisher in the wrong part of the finisher if you're doing a you know queen below and queen excluder, queen cells above sort of arrangement, which is what I it did for many years. I don't do that anymore, but that's another story. It's probably a talk on its own.